Welcome to the Values Exchange Podcast. I'm Mike Cruz, your host, private pilot, author of Saturday Every Day, and CEO of North Texas Wealth Management, a firm dedicated to values-based financial planning. This podcast uncovers the values and habits of highly successful people and dives into how it has shaped their success and what you can learn from their personal stories. Welcome back to the Values Exchange podcast. Um, I'm excited to uh, share with you some information today about the market. I think investors are all wondering, you know, mid-year, what's the rest of the year look like? Are we going to have a recession? And so our guest today is the person to answer that. Mira Pandit is, you know, off and on, you know, Bloomberg, Yahoo Finance, CNN, um, all in the, the new, you know, turn on the TV, you're going to see her and we're going to ask her exactly that. Help us understand what is a recession? You know, what's it going to look like? When's it going to happen? And, um, you know, what should investors be doing to be prepared? So Mira uh, from New York, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here today. All right. So, you know, I, being with JP Morgan um, as a strategist, um, you know, there's so much information. I always go to guide to the markets. Um, it's this great slide deck updated uh, very frequently. I like it because it's data driven instead of getting, you know, a bunch of opinions and uh, go back to the data. So tell me a little bit about your role with the guide to markets. I think what you've said is exactly right. It's all about the data. And we're not here to forecast. We're not here to predict the future. We're merely here to see the present with clarity and really try to simplify the complex because there's so much data out there. And in a period like this, there's a lot of conflicting data. I mean, we're getting so many mixed signals from the economy and we've had such big distorting factors like massive monetary stimulus, massive fiscal stimulus. And that has really change the nature of the recovery that we've seen in the economy over the last couple of years. So our purview is really about simplifying that and distilling it down into, to the best of our abilities, what are we seeing today? Yeah, very good. So, you know, this topic of recession, it's interesting because people say, are we going into a recession? Are we going into a recession? And, you know, my frequent answer is, you know, a recession is just a part of the business cycle. So yes, we're always going to have a recession. But I think the question is kind of acute at this moment because the most recent recessions we've had have been really the worst in 30 years, right? We had the 08, which was just such a significant, you know, downturn in the market, followed by, you know, um, you know, the COVID reaction in 2020. And so now when we say the word recession, it's a little bit of a knee jerk reaction. Um, what's your opinion of you know, we're always going into a recession at some point, but what do you think that looks like? Is that going to happen in 2023? And if so, is it, is it going to be as significant as it has been in the past? The word recession certainly elicits an emotional response, especially given the last two recessions were some of the most severe we've seen in the last hundred or so years. So I think it's important to think about the nature of what this recession could look like. And maybe the good news is we have been talking about it for 18 months, so it's certainly not going to catch anyone by surprise when we eventually do see a recession. And I think what's also helpful about that is it means that we've continued to expect the economy to slow, but the resiliency of the economy has continued to defy expectations. And maybe that can help prevent us from having a more severe recession and instead we can see something a little bit more mild, certainly than the last two that we've seen. Now, a lot of people say, okay, so the next recession will be short and shallow and kind of write it off. But I think the reality is while it might be shallow because we don't see a huge shock to the economy at this point that's gonna cause something more severe, but rather uh, a slow lumbering growth that eventually falls over, um, I think it won't necessarily be short because what we saw after the pandemic is such an incredible fiscal and monetary response that really jolted the economy out of recession. And of course, there was the unusual nature of the pandemic of the economy closing and then opening back up that contributed to that. But usually fiscal and monetary policy are those cures for a recession to help things get going again. But if one of the big issues that we're facing right now is inflation and potentially sticky inflation, then the Federal Reserve is not going to want to cut to zero. Maybe they'll want to cut a bit on the margins, but they're going to want to be a little bit more steadfast in their monetary policy. And then when we think about Congress, uh, very little appetite to put forth new fiscal stimulus because they are thinking 
about inflation as well. So if we don't see that fiscal and monetary response this time, it could be a mild recession, but one that lingers. You know, I think about it a little bit like the cough you can't shake. And it's not all that serious, but again, you're just coughing for weeks. So we might be in that type of dynamic with the economy. Sure. Yeah, and so what what data are you looking at? Do you have a favorite chart that you're watching right now to kind of be that indicator for you? And then what are what are those factors that we would be watching that would indicate that, you know, we're coming out of the recession or whether or not it's going to be as shallow as we hope? So because we've been thinking about the recession for so long and because no one data point has really given us a clear signal on what's going to happen, I, I have a couple of different frameworks I like to, to rely on when I'm thinking about the health of the economy. So one of them is economic activity. Another is chronology, thinking about the typical order in which the economy tends to fall over. And then the last piece is really thinking about the components of the economy itself and where the vulnerabilities are. So if I think about economic activity first, and, and we have a nice slide in, in the guide uh, that looks at recession determinants and economic activity, and it basically looks at a heat map of consumer spending, consumer income, two different measures of jobs, retail sales, industrial production. And what we're seeing in this heat map is, is kind of a mixed bag where economic momentum is slowing, but it, it's not really showing any clear signs that we're in recession yet. So the state of play right now is, um, you know, worse off than we were last year, but at the same time, not in a particularly bad position. So then I think about chronology. Well, there's all these different pieces of data. They must follow some sort of order of operations. And that's a really key one. And I like to use the old acronym HOPE. Housing, output, profits, employment. That is usually the order in which you see things starting to weaken. So, you know, first area is sort of the interest rate sensitive areas of the economy as the Fed has hiked rates. So you've seen that in housing. Housing has kind of found its footing at this point, actually. You know, it went through uh, quite a downturn, uh, perhaps not the 08 style downturn, just given the lack of inventory we see in housing overall. But it certainly went through a period of weakness and is starting to pick back up when you look at some of the data. Then I think about output or, or manufacturing. If you look at purchasing manufacturers index, if you look at those data, uh, that looks still weak on the manufacturing side. Um, I think about the UR here is, is kind of in between the O and the P because we're seeing from a profits perspective, things are weakening, but haven't really fallen off a cliff yet. And I don't think they will, um, but I think you could see a bit of further weakness ahead. And then you look at employment and that is typically the last shoe to drop. And so I do worry that people are getting a little bit complacent about the strength of the labor market. You know, you mentioned one indicator and everyone keeps pointing to the strength of the labor market to say we're OK. But the reality is it's a lagging indicator. Usually we see about an eight month lag between that bottom tick in the unemployment rate and until we actually go into recession. And actually, the unemployment rate continues to rise typically as we're in recession and usually doesn't even peak until we're actually out of it. So I do want to be a little bit careful about getting too complacent about the E. And then the last framework I think about is, okay, what are actually the components of the economy? What drives the economy and where do we see vulnerabilities? So 70% of the economy is driven by the consumer. And all the consu although the consumer is a bit softer, the consumer is by no means weak. So I, I do think that while we're going to see things like resumption of student loan payments and eating into excess savings and taking on of more and more credit as signs of, of a little bit of weakness in the consumer, there's still that wherewithal to spend. So it's, it's not an area we think is going to collapse. Um, again, housing, uh, it's actually a relatively small part of the overall economy, but we're seeing that start to rebound. The bigger area of concern for us is really around businesses, because if you marry the slowing down in profit growth and also the uh, limited availability at this point or, or less and less credit growth, then if companies don't have a source of, of funding to draw upon, that's going to hurt their ability to invest. And it's going to hurt their ability to hire and maintain their workforces. So I think that really that slowdown in the business sector is what could potentially uh, push us into recession once and for all. But again, if the consumer is somewhat resilient in that environment, could be a, a pretty mild recession. Yeah, agreed. I think um, so. The, the question of the hour is if that recession is likely in the near term or are we looking at 2024? What do you see for the rest of 2023? At this point, just given where the data is and how resilient it's been through mid-year, 
it's very likely that we can avoid a recession in 2023. Uh, but I think 2024 is a, a different story. Um, I, I think what we're looking for in terms of triggers of, OK, we're, we've made it. Here we are. We're seeing some real weakness is, is perhaps a negative print from a jobs perspective, that negative payroll growth. But we just thus far have not seen that we're quite there yet. In fact, payrolls are still elevated relative to their long term averages. We're still getting some pretty decent job growth. Again, lagging indicator. But I think that that can that can push us through the rest of 2023 it's really 2024 that we worry about. Because at this point with the Fed having raised rates as high as they have and, and probably going to go a little bit further when it seems like we're already seeing some of that gradual deceleration in inflation, to us points to the fact that we could very well see a policy error. And I'll bring this back to the you know, businesses across the country because, look, let's, let's think about the regional banking crisis and the fact that you have areas that are less able to lend. It's not necessarily that people are worried anymore about their deposits and you're seeing deposit flight. But if you think about a 5% yield in a money market fund or in short duration fixed income, then it, it's hard for banks to hold on to their deposits, not because people are worried, but because people want better income. So that puts some pressure on those banking models. And, and the challenge is if you're a small bank, you are catering to regional businesses, regional employers. So if they're experiencing weakness, that is bringing that economic weakness into communities across the country. So that is a slow process to play out. But I think that we could see some of that start to kick in and eventually lead us to potential recession next year. Yeah, and I think one thing for investors to understand is there is a difference between maybe the economy and what's going on as far as a recession and what markets are doing. Um, and so a lot of times, you know, we could be right in that recession and then markets could be in the recovery. There could be a lag period. But, you know, I want you to help kind of define what is a recession, because I think there's kind of a misconception out there that it's just, you know, two quarters of a down market when really it's, it's a lot more involved than that. Can you kind of outline, like, how do you define a true recession? When we think about the last two recessions, we never had this discussion because they were so severe and, and came on so sharply that we, we really didn't have to think, are we in recession or are we not? Because things were just that bad. Um, over the last 18 months, as we thought about, are we or aren't we in recession? We've really had to define, what does it mean to go into a recession? And the, the sort of textbook technical definition, if you think about um, just GDP growth, is that you, you tend to see two negative quarters of GDP. But the reality is we already saw that in 2022 and did not consider it a recession because, again, we still saw this extremely strong overall economic recovery um, from, from the post-pandemic world. So we really had to go back to the, the definition of who declares a recession and how do they do it. So it's actually this council called the National Bureau of Economic Research that determines an official recession. Usually they do so pretty far after the fact, but even they don't have a very strict rubric they basically look for a significant decline in economic activity. Now, I mentioned that slide from the guide that had a couple of different indicators on it. We've ripped those indicators straight from what the National Bureau of Economic Research looks at. So we can look at the same things that they look at, but in real time, because again, they, they won't tell us till maybe months or years later. So again, those indicators were income, spending, both the different measures of jobs, both payrolls and, and actual jobs itself, people, people employed. Um, and, and, and then retail sales and industrial production. So those are the areas where we're looking for a significant decline. Again, we haven't quite seen it yet. Um, I think that really maybe the tip off will be again, that, that negative payroll growth to get us to a sense that we're there, but it's actually less about what the market is doing and more about what those economic indicators are doing. But I agree with you that it's been somewhat confusing because last year, was a really bad year for the markets. And yet it seems like we haven't gone into that recession yet. And so I think it's always useful to remember that markets and the economy look in opposite directions. Markets are forward looking. They are discounting a whole range of potential outcomes, risks, and threats. Whereas the economy is at best looking at today, but really looking at yesterday and a month ago, when we think about economic data that comes out, that's essentially backward looking. So when we think about what happened last year versus this year, I think the best way to think about it is a lot of the potential downside that we could see through the rest of 2023 and into 2024 from an economic standpoint has been a, at least well understood by the markets and has been begun to be priced in. I wouldn't say everything is priced in, so don't worry about it. I think we could still see a pullback from here in the markets, but I don't think we have to see that, that similar low in the markets that we saw in last October.
Yeah, I appreciate that. I think that uh, really shines a light on a lot of confusion that, you know, are we in a recession? What is a recession? You just hear the word, you know, left and right. And sometimes we don't pause and go, what does that really mean? So I think that's that's very helpful for the investor to understand that. Um, and, and so as a global strategist, I just kind of want to throw a uh, kind of a, a broad question at you. What are you thinking about like globally? Um, there's there's kind of so much going on with the world I and mean, we haven't really experienced, you know, the inflation that we've had in 40 years. We've had these two significant, you know, downturns and now significant Fed policy. It just kind of feels like, you know, where are we, where are we headed globally? Um, you know, what's going on? And, you know, obviously with Russia. So kind of the big question is, what do you just see as the like emerging market trends and, you know, what shifts do you see with you know technology and how is that going to drive things forward? I think we came into this year, if we think just about last year and, and, and the outlook for this year, we came into this year expecting global growth outside the U.S. would do better than the U.S. And instead, what we've seen is that the U.S. has been really resilient in terms of growth. And yet areas like China and Europe have looked a little bit less rosy. Um, from a European standpoint, we were very excited that Europe got through the winter without having a major energy crunch and, and adequately filled up their supplies. That was supposed to precipitate a severe recession if that didn't go off. And it, it sort of did end up going off with without too much fanfare. Um, but now we're looking at pretty high inflation in Europe that's requiring their central banks to continue to hike rates. So that is a challenge there. And, and I think if we look under the hood, it's not just the higher energy and food prices that we have seen in Europe precipitated by the, the war between Russia and Ukraine, but it is very much the fact that wages have accelerated. Now, wages have accelerated in the U.S. too, but remember that in other areas of the world, like Europe, like Japan, there is much more of a collective wage agreement. So that can make wages a bit stickier in other places, whereas in the U.S., we don't really have that collective bargaining power. So when people start to get nervous about their ability to keep their jobs, then employers regain some of that power in terms of, of how much wage increase they, they really want to offer. So wages and still food and energy prices is a bit of an issue within Europe. If we go a little bit further out over to China, a lot of enthusiasm about this reopening um, in China and getting out of zero COVID policy as they did in December. And yet we started to see that that recovery sputter a bit because there is this sort of crisis of confidence going on in China. And it really stems from some of the actions taken in 2020 and 2021 around the property sector. Uh, the property sector is essentially the biggest sector in the Chinese economy. So it, of course, impacts business confidence. But also from a consumer standpoint, you know, the, the typical Chinese household balance sheet you know, the wealth, the income, the retirement, it's all really rolled into property. They don't get great social benefits. Um, you know, their, their stock market is not necessarily as as deep um, and, and widespread as ours. So they, they, they really tend to concentrate their, their chips in, in the property sector. So when that is weak, that is really a bit of a threat. So you have a bit of consumer weakness there. We potentially need to see some greater fiscal or monetary stimulus to pull the Chinese market kind of out of the doldrums at this point. So high level, I would say that the, the, for, the fortunes have somewhat reversed over the course of this year where U.S. growth has, has continued to be resilient. And there have been other issues that have cropped up economically in some of the other major regions of the world. So something that we have to be a bit cognizant of. But I would say, to your point about longer term trends, uh, when I think outside of the U.S. about the rest of the global economy, look, China wants to be the largest economy in the world, and they are making very concentrated bets in different sectors in order to do that in areas like the consumer, uh, technology, kind of the next wave of technology beyond e-commerce to so things like AI and robots. Um, and even decarbonization, you know, they're a big coal user, but they're also uh, actually at this point a pretty large generator of renewable energy as well and electric vehicles. So investing alongside with some of those big policy bets can be helpful in the long term for investors. And then, you know, if I think again about Europe, uh, one big change that we're seeing right now is that Europe went from basically a decade of negative interest rates and fiscal austerity Whereas now they're going into a period of firmly positive interest rates and actually quite a bit of cooperation around fiscal policy and greater spending. And I think that's going to support growth and support some of their cyclical sectors, which they are so heavily um, weighted towards. So that can help 
bring a new vibrancy, I think, in the longer term to, to the European economy. So I think, again, some of the fortunes have been re reversed in the beginning of this year from a U.S. versus global perspective. But I think just as there are many opportunities for long-term investors in the U.S., there's a lot of exciting things going on internationally that will play out over the next, call it, three to five years or more. No, great. And so, you know, in speaking of technology and AI, I mean, there's a, a lot of hype right now with, with AI and really driving the markets, you know, specifically the technology and large cap growth. How much of that do you feel is we're just on the, you know, the beginnings or, or is it all overhyped? It feels like we're maybe in the, the second inning, maybe the third inning, because I do recognize that we've been talking about AI for quite some time, and it was almost a joke for a while. When is this AI revolution going to come? It, it always seems five years out, but it finally does seem like it's here. And I think that some of the immediate beneficiaries have been mega cap tech. But I think we also have to consider the fact that there are many internet companies that were very successful in the early days of the internet that we don't talk about anymore, that simply don't exist anymore. So we have to be aware that I think there's a whole new crop of players that are going to come to the AI space over the next decade that could be really some of the big winners here. Uh, you know, I think about some of our portfolio managers on the growth side, and, and they, they put together this great slide that basically looks at different transitions over time by decade uh, in terms of technology, you know, personal computing, internet, cloud, and they look at the top 10 stocks uh, at the end of each decade. And they're almost entirely different at the end of each decade. So I think that we want to be aware that the top stocks of 2020, and they're broadly the top stocks of 2023, are probably not going to be those same names at the end of, uh, at the onset of the 2030s. So I think we have to be a little bit nimble about this. We don't want to price in the entire AI revolution in one year in five stocks. So really think about what some of these companies can achieve over the long run and, and hold them to it. And that means really looking at profits and really looking at what actual innovation is coming through. It also means, again, to the, to the point about your last question, let's think not just in the U.S. markets, but some of the other places around the world that are also going to capitalize on this. But uh, I, I would say slow and steady wins the race here because there's probably a lot of innovation and application to come that we're not even aware of on day one. Yeah, very good. And and so, you know, being a global strategist, you hear and look at actual data, all this market information. What do you find is the most, <clears throat> like, when you hear misinformation and kind of just that, you know, cringe of like, oh, that's not really how it's working. What, what do you feel like is out there right now that's misinformation that you're hearing? You know, when it comes to the economy, we're getting a lot of big, meaty, existential questions. And so sometimes I feel like when the, the realm of politics starts to seep into uh, some of our economic and, and market outlook, um, that's when you, you get people, you know, very much reacting emotionally. We see this uh, very much in terms of investing around elections, um, but, but also when we think about some of these geopolitical challenges. Uh, you know, we've gotten a lot of questions on dollar dominance, for example. Um, will the U.S. Uh, default on its debt? Eventually, maybe we avoided that with the debt ceiling here. Um, but I think that maybe one source of, I wouldn't call it misinformation, but maybe misunderstanding is that some of these headlines that people talk about, whether it's dollar dominance or U.S. debt issues or um, uh, various geopolitical standoffs, they play out over a number of years typically. And I think we put a lot of, you know, deglobalization is another one. We, we, we kind of latch onto some of these terms. I wouldn't say, again, that it's misinformation. I think a lot of these issues are real issues for the long term. But I think maybe we get the timeline wrong a little bit, um, that these things are happening tomorrow or these things can happen on a dime. Um, a lot of these are larger structural themes as opposed to things that are, are on our immediate horizon. So maybe it's just kind of thinking about time horizons a little bit when it comes to some of these issues, when it comes to investing overall, I think we've kind of very much gotten accustomed to this 24 hour news cycle and, and even, you know, 24 minute, it seems like sometimes with uh, some of the different media platforms and the just amount of information we're getting. So I think it's, it's, it's just a matter of putting some of this information into, into perspective. Oh, I think, I think that's absolutely right. I think you're right. It's the time horizon. You know, a lot of times people underestimate, you know, what can be done in 10 years versus, you know, what you can do in a year. 
I think that's just human nature. And I think a good example of that is like fusion, you know, energy. So it's a, it's a, you know, everybody's talking about it, but you know, if you talk to the actual scientists, they're on, oh no, 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 this is like way off. It's going to take a long time to get there longer than anybody thinks. And so, yeah, I think that's just human nature to kind of get the time horizon incorrect. So, I, yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's not point. only it, it, just because something is scientifically possible. There's also the cost angle to it. So some of these amazing innovations um, in a number of different areas, while maybe possible technically uh, to get them to scale and to get them to be profitable and to get them to be, again, spread out kind of in a, in a massive way uh, is a whole nother ball game. Time, so. Well, I really appreciate your time today, um, shedding some light on, you know, understanding recession, what it means, what we're looking at, and, um, you know, giving us some confidence, understanding kind of the headwinds and tailwinds. So thank you so much for your time and uh, really appreciate it. Thank you for having me.